This is the Intellectual Investor Podcast. Special episode, Infinite Loops Interview. For more episodes, go to investor.fm. Or to read this article instead, head to contrarianedge.com. Vitaly sits down with Jim O'Shaughnessy, author of the classic investment book, What Works on Wall Street, and host of the Infinite Loops podcast. Vitaly and Jim seem to share a brain as they discuss Vitaly's youth in Soviet Russia, how creativity connects the conscious and unconscious mind, the power of reframing and developing a thick skin, and the joys of classical music. Enjoy this wide-ranging and fun conversation between two students of life. Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. How many? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll get to a thousand. Maybe I'll just decide that I'm bored with it and stop doing it altogether. Now, I would never do that because it gives me the opportunity to talk to some of the smartest people in some of the most interesting fields. And today I have one of those people with me. I am absolutely delighted to welcome Vitaly Katzenelson who is like, Vitaly, I think in an alternate universe, we may actually be brothers because, (laughs) (laughs) so you're a value investor. I play both sides of that because momentum and I do the empirical research. You're the CEO of IMA, which is a manager. What we're going to talk mostly about is your book, Soul in the Game, which you very thoughtfully sent me and which I read and loved. But also just, we share so many of the same passions classical music travel art stoicism oh my god welcome and this will be fun jim it's such a pleasure and i'll tell you i really got to know you a lot more and i feel like i know you now through twitter and i feel like there are certain observations i have about you there number one you're like the statesman you're the person who sets the tone for twitter this is how you should behave on twitter okay that's number one number two I don't think I've seen anybody do memes as well as you do. You're <laughs> the king of memes. But aside from that, I think just, you're so right. You like have so much in common. And a lot of times, and I learn a lot, you just, if somebody doesn't follow you on Twitter, which is unlikely if they listen to your podcast, they should. <laughs> because if I only had to follow one person, I would be following you on Twitter. I'm very flattered. Thank you. And I am susceptible to flattery. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to be just so much fun. I told you before we started recording that my wife often asks me who I'm having on. And she goes, Oh, you, the guy who wrote Soul in the Game. And I went, Yeah. And she goes, You're going to have an intuitive, fun conversation with him. And I think that's exactly what we're going to do. But for people who might not have read, the book and might not know your background. You were born in Russia. You made it to America. And I want to start there. I want to jump in there because it's such an interesting story. 
And I'd like you to also concentrate on something that I picked up from the book, which was when your aunt moved to America prior to you, you initially kind of labeled her a traitor, a spy, and then there was a transformation. But I'm going to leave it to you because you tell the story so much better. It's very important to understand. So I was growing up in the Soviet Union, kind of a Soviet Russia, and I cannot, like now looking back, it's amazing how brainwashed I was. It's just incredibly. In fact, what I realized how important movies are as a medium of brainwashing. I remember there was a movie like the mid-1980s where a guy lives for the United States and he's treated like, this is like the worst person in the world. Like I remember in this movie, this is like the, like you can't do anything worse than that. And so these things little by little shape you. And also, when I was, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, they would take us to movie theaters and they would show us documentaries, which would basically portray Americans as this people without a soul that only care about money, lynch black people, and poison everybody with hamburgers and french fries. And of course, the hamburger story is completely true and french fries. <laughs> <laughs> and so my father has two younger sisters. The youngest one lived in Moscow, and we lived in Murmansk, so it's far away. So I would come to Moscow once or twice a year to see my grandparents. And I remember, so I was born in 1973. I remember sometime in late 1970s, for some reason, my aunt disappeared and my cousins. And like a six or seven year old, you kind of don't think about it. But then at some point you ask the question, where are they? And my parents said, well, she moved to Siberia. They couldn't find a job here. They moved to Siberia and it's very far away. That's why we don't see them. And as a young mind, you're like, okay, your parents tell this. That's true. Fast forward to 1988 or 1989. The Berlin Wall already kind of broken down, like maybe either coming down or already came down, I think. And I just watched, like the movie I just referred to, I just watched it recently, just it's still fresh in my head. And my father tells me, you know, like we told you about your aunt who lives in Siberia. I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, she's not in Siberia. She's in the United States. And the first innate emotion, the reaction is like, she's a traitor. Like, this is my aunt, my father's sister. I know her parents. <laughs> and that is the first thought that came to me. And then my father said, well, listen, she lived in 1979, which what happened was, this is a very typical story of Russian Jews at the time. So you couldn't really leave Russia to go for the United States. That was impossibility. But the Russia would allow you to immigrate to Israel. A lot of Russians, what they would do they would get on the plane, and luckily, there was no direct flight. Or maybe there was, but I don't think there was a direct flight to Israel. But there were direct flights to a lot of European cities. So what they would do, they would fly to Vienna or Rome. That's where most immigrants went. And they would show up to American embassy and say, well, we were going to Israel, but really we want to come to the United States. And I think there was some American legislature that made that very, very simple. She ended up in Brooklyn. Like when you was, watch Moscow and Hudson, that kind of was describing your life. What was interesting about this, I just mentioned Moscow and Hudson. I remember when I watched Moscow and Hudson for the first time. I want you to picture this. Imagine a huge apartment building, huge, that has maybe, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of apartments. And then in the basement, it has a very large space. And what people would do, this is like 1980s, like now late 80s. They would basically take a VCR and connect maybe several TVs to it. And they would play American movies dubbed into Russian. This became our cinema. So if you wanted to watch new American movies, if you wanted to watch Rambo, if you wanted to watch whatever, Schwarzenegger and Stallone were huge then. Or if you wanted to watch Moscow and Hudson, that's where you would watch it because they would not show it in the movie theater. And of course, every single voice there was kind of the same person played all the parts. Didn't matter. And the quality was horrible and everything. But these kind of underground movie theaters changed our perception of what America was. Now, this is very interesting. What you don't realize, most American movies are kind of shot on the coasts, either New York or Hollywood or Los Angeles, somewhere there. What was my perception of America? Skyscrapers or palm trees? <laughs> this is 1991. My aunt invites us. At this point, I'm already embracing America. Okay. And my family, is coming to America. Our trip actually was, you know, like most immigrant story has this drama. Our story has the opposite version of this because when we flew from Frankfurt to New York, I think Pan Am, that was a Pan Am flight, they 
oversold economy class. So we were actually, we, we flew first class. To, <laughs> to I United love States, it. <laughs> to United States. But anyway, we arrived to Denver and I have this incredible shock. First of all, number one, we just came from Moscow. And in Moscow, it was incredibly cold. It's like insanely cold. We land in Denver on December 3rd or 4th, whatever. And it's 70 something degrees. Everybody's wearing shorts, which is a shock. Because that's number one. Number two, I look around and this is kind of average, like typical America. Very few skyscrapers, maybe in downtown, which we don't see at first. Just a lot of flat buildings. There's a lot of three, four story buildings. That was a shock too. So anyway, that's kind of my coming to America story a little bit. I love this story for so many reasons. And one of the big reasons is the idea that you and I think a lot about. And that is this idea of social programming and very few people being aware of how programmed they are. It doesn't have to be a totalitarian USSR. It's any culture. And some do it intentionally. And usually there's ways to figure out when that's going to be filter failure for them. And you mentioned it, like the underground movies were presenting a very different version of America. And so the idea that you can also reprogram your conditioning, I think is something that we both would probably assign a truth to. Oh my God. Almost we are jumping 50 chapters into the book. I've been thinking so much about it lately. In fact, like in the volume two of the book, the stuff I'm working right now, that's all I'm writing about. That's all I'm thinking about. Because so we have, let me give you the couple of frameworks, which actually not, I don't think they are in the book. I don't remember they are. So we have like a conscious subconscious mind. And by the way, like it's kind of interesting. I'm talking about conscious mind and subconscious mind as if I know what I'm talking about. And brain is one of the most complex organs we have. And we know a lot about it, but very still very little. But one thing I realized, if you ask me where my liver is or where my kidney is, I may be able to kind of say somewhere behind the walls of my stomach, I kind of know what my mind does, more or less. So this frameworks are not perfect, but I think they can help to explain how mind works and they come to this. So the two frameworks, number one is iPhone and mainframe or AWS, if you like. So if you think about our conscious mind, it has a processor, a lot of sensors, our eyes, et cetera, our hearing, et cetera. And it has a processor of iPhone and it has a very limited storage. And then you think about our subconscious mind it's AWS, it's a mainframe, it's IBM mainframe. This has enormous amount of storage, it has a huge processing and enormous storage. However, so that storage is not accessible to us in real time. And when we do something creative, this is what creates connection between a conscious mind and subconscious mind. You write, and you know this, you sit down to write something and you have a kind of a gist of an idea. And then, when you finished it and you read what you wrote, it's almost like you read it for the first time. It's almost like you did not write it because that came from this dance between conscious mind and subconscious mind. And also, when we do something, and this is very important, when we do something many times, the example would be when you drive a car. Your kid's are a little bit older than mine, but yesterday, my 16-year-old daughter was driving a car with me for the second time. And I'll tell you, we're driving on the road and if she wants to change the volume of the music, suddenly the car goes left or right. Uh, because right. <laughs> everything is happening in her conscious mind. And she's trying to think about where the hands are on the wheel, all these different things that you and I take for granted. Because what happened in the beginning, it was happening in the conscious mind. Then conscious, it became a routine and conscious mind basically uploaded or downloaded, whatever you want to look at it, to subconscious mind. So now... When you're driving to work and at times you don't even know how you got to work because it's, you were daydreaming and subconscious mind basically was taking care of this. So this is very important because there are so many implications there. Okay, so let me, let me go to the second framework. The second framework, and this one is even more important to where we're going. It's a captain and like you have a cruise ship or whatever ship and you have a captain and you have an engine room. Our conscious mind is a captain. Our conscious mind has judgment. Its captain has a judgment. The engine room, all it does is just, it keeps the ship going. It doesn't know where it's going. It gets instructions from the captain. So why is this important? Because our subconscious mind, 
does not understand irony, uh, does not understand sarcasm. So when I say, oh, I'm an idiot, you basically send in instructions to your subconscious mind, you're an idiot. And so we get to, through our conscious mind, through our conscious actions, I would argue, and this is very, very important, we get to reprogram our subconscious mind. So whenever you have an innate response to something, usually that comes from your subconscious mind. Whenever you take a breath and tweak your response, that subconscious mind kicked in. The reason it's important, I have this story. I have two friends. One is Matt, and he lives in Seattle, and I call him the Jesus of Seattle. And I have another one, Darren, he lives in Denver, I call him the Moses of Denver for (laughs) geographic (laughs) religious reasons. And Jim, they are the nicest people I ever met. I never heard a single negative word from them, either one of them. And they're my heroes when it comes to being kind. And when I say a negative word about, I was talking to Darren, I'm asking him about this person he works with. I know how I would have responded. But Darren phrased it like, you know what? He responded in a very neutral way. Why is this important? I don't know how Matt and Darren got programmed, but this in their innate subconscious programming is automatically being kind. And what I would argue is that the words you use program you. Over time, you become what you say, okay? So I have this goal in my life, and this is real. Like I want to become kind, but I want to be innately kind. I want to be like them. And to do this, I need to be kind all the time. And this means is that when I'm eating dinner at 8 o'clock in the evening, and I get a call from a telemarketer, I am as kind to this person as if it was my father. Because if I do this enough, then it's going to take very little effort for me to be kind to everybody all the time. To get to your point, I think we have this incredible ability to program ourselves, to reprogram. Our be- Once we notice we are doing something we don't like, we can reprogram that. It just takes a lot of time and effort. So much to talk about there. We are very simpatico just listening to you. I was smiling, as you could see. So I did the piece called The Thinker and the Prover. I don't know if you've looked at that. I should send it to you because when you look at it, you're going to go, oh my God, this is what I'm talking about. I haven't, but I would love to see it. Yeah, please. I'll send it to you. And it is very much a thread to teach people how to do what you've just said. I have been obsessed with the so-called unconscious, subconscious mind since I was a teenager. Back in the 70s, there were a lot of programs that were mostly bullshit, to be honest, but based on some concepts like the one you just outlined, that were very, very interesting to me. And I'm huge on self-experimentation. I've got to do it myself first to see if there's any value there. And so there is a tremendous amount of value in what you've just said. And the problem, when you read my Thinker Prover, you're going to see that, as you've said, the thinker can imagine that they're going to be kind and they'll get kindness in return. If they really believe that, their prover takes over. That would be the unconscious. And the prover is like, okay, you're kind. I'm going to prove to you that you are kind. And I'm going to, all of a sudden, you are going to, if you wanted to be like reductionist and materialistic about this, you could say, all you've done is engaged your reticular activating system. You know, when you buy a car, you think it's unique. And then all of a sudden you see that same car everywhere. Yeah, Yeah. It's because your perception filters controlled mostly by the subconscious, have, oh, he, my owner here, (laughs) has decided he likes that green fiat. I'm going to show him all of the green fiats because I want him to know what a good decision he's made. And so the prover can prove anything you want it to prove. And this is the part where so many people just say, oh, that's bullshit. I got to tell you, 40 years of experimenting with this stuff, I know N equals one, but it works. And so I love your idea about, okay, I'm going to program myself to be kind. Can I give you one example? Just so something happened to me. So I was working on this. I have a real data point, again, N01, just like yours, but this has happened. This happened to me. So I work out twice a week and I found that I have a willpower to give things up, like I quit smoking, but I have very little willpower to actually do things. By the way, me saying this, I should not have been saying what I'm saying because my subconscious can hear this, which I hate. But okay, so I, <laughs> for a long time, I was telling people, so I have a trainer. Twice a week, I work out with a trainer. 
and I've been doing it for four years. I have an appointment on my, on my calendar, unbreakable, unless I'm traveling or something. It has to be a huge emergency. This worked for me. Now, I've been telling people for a long time how much I hate working out, but I'm working out because I have a trainer. Okay. And then I realized I'm basically programming myself to hate working out. So I realized I need to change the language. So this happened three weeks ago, I think. I started to play with this. The trainer we've been working on for so long, he became a good friend of mine. So I come to work out and I say how much I love working out and I go over the top. It's just completely, he gives me, me some weight. I'm like, this is all, I can do so much more. Long story short, that workout, I set all personal records that were 40% more than before. I didn't become stronger, but I think what happened, I suppressed, I just basically suppressed my strength. And I tell you now, whenever I talk about it, this is the part, like I got to be very careful when I say, because they can hear me. <laughs> now I become very, very careful what I say. And now when I work out, I tell myself, I love working out. I'm looking forward to it. And you know what? I'm not sure how much I believe it yet, but at some point I will. And it's going to be just, I can't wait to come to the gym. That's my N01. So when I post the picture of our conversation, I usually post a picture of you and talk about what we talked about. In this case, we are so tuned into each other that the minute you start saying that to me, I also have a thread on how to make anything a habit. Because, and by the way, the answer is exactly what you're doing. And I tried it on myself, of course, because I, like you, hate it working out and reprogram myself in 15 days. And with me, though, I didn't even notice. My wife and I were away at an engagement early dinner because it was with family and I have grandkids. But so I hadn't exercised that day. And without thinking about it, this is what's key. I just went up to my bedroom, put on my workout gear and started heading down to our lower level where our gym is. And my wife looks at me and she goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, I haven't worked out today. And she's like, but that's not you. <laughs> you would use this as an excuse to say, oh, God, it's too late or whatever. And so my aha moment, which I also cover in the thread was, holy shit, I reprogrammed myself so much I wasn't even aware of it. Oh my God, I love it. So I am just a huge believer in human operating system. That's been what I've spent most of my life trying to understand because no owner's manual, man. And <laughs> you mentioned it earlier, we're walking around with these quantum computers in our skulls and we don't have a user's manual. And I tend to to err on the side of practicality. So what am I going to reprogram myself to do? I'm going to reprogram myself to do these positive things because there's a many, many studies on willpower and it really dissipates very quickly. And also the idea of the unconscious subconscious, obviously Jung was the master, I think, of that. But there's also studies that show that the unconscious portion of our brain consumes like a ridiculous amount of the energy of the brain. And we always use the best analogy or metaphor that everyone gets. So when Plato was talking about it, he talked about the mind as charioteers, because everybody knew what a charioteer was in the Athens of Plato. And now the convenient one that we use that you've used both. And it's convenient because everyone instantly understands That's what right. you're saying. So the thing that people don't know so much that I have through research and through luckily learning from super smart guests like yourself on this podcast, that the idea that our executive mind, the newest part of the human brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. So I've always thought of it like you mentioned, the captain. My friend Rory Sutherland, who's an ad man in London. And I think he's quoting someone else here, but he's like, no, no, Jim. He goes, your conscious mind, that's the press office. It's not the Oval Office. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and I would add that you've got to get the thoughts out of your head onto paper. And there's a reason why. When they're banging around in here, we can think, oh, yeah, I know what I think about that, blah, blah, blah. The minute you've got to write it out, you either discover, yeah, you do know what you think about that, or far more often, you find, I have no fucking idea what that means. I better do some homework. It's, yeah, because you don't see the logical connection. The logical connections you think you know, like once you put it down, you see, 
Oh, there's logical links missing. Absolutely. Can I add one thing? Actually, you said something. I have this chapter called Abracadabra. And I think this kind of relates to what you said about thoughts. And Abracadabra from Hebrew is, I create as I speak. I love that. And if you think about this, like you have to be very careful when you get into an argument with someone, because especially on a fresh topic for you, because your beliefs will be completely randomly shaped a lot of times based on the first thought that into your mind and the position you took when you started to debate something. And then because what happened, this is very important, then it will become your identity. This is like incredibly important because we should be so careful and we curate what our identity is because that is set in stone. That is who we are. And in fact, the process of like me being kind that is part of my identity, and that's what I'm shaping. And what, because once it's there, the subconscious mind is getting control of that. Now, we have to be in a sign. In the chapter, I talk about four modes, communications, which I think is probably, what, like, to be honest, that's probably one of the chapters that had the biggest impact on me. Though I say this, and we'll talk about different chapters, I say the same thing, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> But this is a chapter where, so basically, let me talk about this a little bit. So you have four modes of communications. There are three Ps, and they're all externals. You have a politician, and politician is basically, think about you going on the first date, and you basically, it's not about just, when you think about politicians, we think about politicians, they'll lie just for you to like them. Well, we do this all the time when we go, when, when we go for a job interview, because we want to be liked. So we tell people what they want to hear. Then you have a preacher. Somebody who just, when I think of preacher, I think sometimes you want to think of these modes as being negative. And they are not, because we all spend some time in them. So preacher, I think about Steve Jobs and his reality distortion field, how successful that was. So I'm just, I'm trying to add a kind of a positive connotation to that. Though you also know the negatives, what negatives are. And then you have a prosecutor, which is like somebody in the courtroom trying to get somebody to change their mind. I would argue we probably spent probably maybe too much time in the prosecutor mode. So, but here's the problem. These modes, they have positive and negatives. But here's the thing. This one commonality they'll have. If you spend all your time in those modes, you're going to learn very little because they are outward facing modes. You're just trying to change somebody's mind or influence other people. And then you have a scientist mode. And this is the mode that you and I, and I'm sure you are already, but people like us should be spending 80% of our time in. Completely agree. Completely agree. Unless we date a lot, etc. In this mode, anything that enters your mind is a hypothesis, which you kind of examine from different directions. And then for a careful examination, you're like, okay, this is what I think. And by the way, if somebody else changes my mind, I'm fine to this. And I tell you this, there's a funny story to this. I wrote this chapter. My son, John, and I, at the time was 20, it's a year ago. We flew to Chicago to pick up my daughter from camp. And so I gave him this chapter to read on a plane ride. And we get to Chicago and we walk in the streets and we're talking about something and that turns into a debate. And he said, Dad, are you in a scientist mode? And I tell you, my first innate reaction was, of course I am. And then I thought about it like, no. <laughs> so you know what I did? I gave this chapter to all my friends and all my employees here too. Well, they read the book. Because now when we have a debate this is a research shop. We debate stocks, et cetera, all the time. When we have a, some kind of discussion and you can feel it's, we are kind of slipping off the scientist mode, we kind of remind each other, let's get back into scientist mode. And I found it to be very important. So anyway, so I kind of derailed you into a different No, direction. you didn't derail me at all because there's also a good book that I recommend by Adam Grant called How to Rethink. That's exactly right. Yeah, he uses similar arguments in there. So... It absolutely is critical that you understand all of these roles. And what I always say to people is, listen, I am just as likely to fall prey to these human OS bugs because I'm running human OS. And maybe I've managed to reprogram mine a little bit better, but you can too. And so I love that idea that you have a shorthand scientist mode that you can immediately go to because it conditions the way people think, literally. I had a thing, a long thing that I wrote on the difference between beliefs and theories, thesis and hypothesis. I use the Karl Popper definition, basically, is this thing I'm looking at falsifiable or not? If it's not falsifiable, I put it in the belief category. 
And it's not that I'm opposed to beliefs. I'm not. It's that I can't go into science mode on it if I can't falsify it. And so there are a lot of things, though, that come off as beliefs and opinions that are actually hypotheses and thesis. And those you can test. And so I do. And one of my biggest aha moments, because when I was young, I was a real proselytizer. I mean, I believed in the power of quantitative factor investing. I was just, I wasn't hearing it if somebody told me that you're an artist. And I was younger and I was filled with testosterone and the ego was way too big. And what I realized was that guy was wrong, not entirely wrong, but you do have to spend some time in the proselytizer or preacher mode. But it's just, I had the great good fortune of really failing badly with a startup called Netfolio. And I just learned so much about how I was wrong. (laughs) But where that leads you to is, if you let it, to the place you're talking about, which is kindness, open-mindedness, and realizing that you're probably wrong. They're almost superpowers, honestly, because you can talk about kindness as putting good karma out. Whatever your reference set, that's fine. And then I took it a step further. I'm like, I bet I could test all this. And so Wittgenstein, I think, said, don't look for meaning, look for use. Meaning, is this useful or not? And I always think of the Ptolemaic astronomy system that was completely wrong, completely wrong. And yet it was useful because they were able to navigate ships much more successfully using Ptolemy's astrophysics. Well, then along comes all these folks like Copernicus and say, this is totally wrong. It's actually the sun that's the center of our solar system and not the earth. Of course, all of the faithful decry it and say it's heresy and progress happens one funeral at a time. But the point is, even though I'm not making the point to say, oh, look at those idiots who followed Ptolemy. Not at all. I'm saying, yeah, he was wrong, but he gave the world an extraordinarily useful tool that allowed for our expansion, for our traveling, for everything. And so even though like getting hooked up in meaning gets to the other point you made, which I have made like a religion of trying to avoid, and that is I'll die on this hill. When something becomes part of your identity, and if you read Influence, you know that that is like one of the first hacks into human OS is get them to state something publicly because then they will put it with their identity and they will become very protective of it. Not me. I always answer on Twitter when they say, you know, I'll die on this hill. And it's about like what type of ranch dressing is better. Uh. Yeah, yeah, no. (laughs) And I always quote George C. Scott, which is, no, 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 no. What you want to do is make the other poor dumb bastard die on his hill. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. This is why when I write articles about stocks, I'm so cognizant of that. Because I just put my thesis out. You want to make sure it doesn't become your identity, that I'm the guy who thinks this stock could only go up. And what was amazing, and actually, I really enjoyed it, actually, surprisingly, when I wrote a like, bull thesis on the company, things changed. And I wrote, this is why I was wrong. This is what changed. And actually, received a tremendous amount of intellectual satisfaction. But I think this is not innate to us. We have to program it. Totally agree. One of the things that I got in the habit of doing a long time ago was writing out, like, so say I believe, I don't, let's just take free speech. I'm kind of a free speech absolutist. That doesn't mean that I don't understand that there are situations like yelling fire in a crowded movie theater. That ain't free speech. That is agitation. That is you're being a bad boy. And so I understand those limits on free speech. But I also got in the habit of writing the opposing view up. And I did that because, A, I know that a lot of things I believe are probably wrong. And so I at least should know what the other side of this is thinking. Sometimes there's not a unified other. In fact, I find that a lot. There's not a unified side on either thing. 
I would say, though, that like my friend Chris Williamson says, if I can infer all of your political beliefs by you telling me one of them, you are an ideologue who, in my opinion, is brain dead. And so the importance of writing out the other side is, A, you see all the holes in your own argument, which don't readily make themselves apparent to you. But B, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes I've written out the other side. I'm like, they're right. (laughs) But it creates a steel man. And I think you got that intellectual satisfaction because that's what you were doing. And the thing that I can't believe, but here we are, I am always willing to say, I don't know. Or like, Jim, what's your opinion on crypto? I don't have one. I have a little bit more of one now. I'm kind of developing one, but I am not well informed enough to like speak on that topic. And so I have a lot of friends who are my generation. And they're like, you really ought to be talking about the dangers of, listen, okay, yeah, they exist. I have articulated them in many thoughts and talks with people, but I don't know the flip side and the good use case side. And so I'm just maintaining, we'll see. And one of my favorite authors, Robert Anton Wilson, who if not read his stuff, you would love his stuff. And he was 50 years ahead of his time. And he's quoting somebody else. And I think I put it up on Twitter not too long ago. It's like, do not decide that you understand things too quickly because you are probably wrong and you are murdering what could be a great idea in its infancy and entombing it. Because again, that's the prover saying, yeah, that's wrong. I'm not going to even look into that any further. And that's the other thing about your writing that I really enjoy and share is that that's kind of the way, at least unless I'm reading you wrong, that is kind of the way that you think. And kudos, man, because A, it's not easy to do. B, it becomes a little addictive when you start thinking that way and you start running everything through that. Yeah, see, that's kind of interesting well, the downside of that is a horrible for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> because when you see people on CNBC and they talk about something without a single doubt in their mind, because they have this confidence just bleeding from them. In reality, like if you've been investing for a long time, you realize things are a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced. In fact, one of my favorite words became nuance. Absolutely. Because nuance basically says things are complex. And therefore, yes, there is this side and there is another side. So I try to look at in the world kind of in a nuanced way. And by the way, you told a story about your book. Let me tell you my story. So I write, like the book is 95% done or something. And I send it to a few friends of mine. And some of them give me this very, very negative feedback. Like it was really negative feedback. One of them said, you should not publish the book. Another said, well, so I pick up the book and what I do with that? Like, where does it take me? Here's the interesting part. And this is meditation and it kind of comes in a little bit. I observe myself getting angry at them and I observe this negative reaction. The good thing is I was observing this and I thought, okay, what if they're right? And then I started to think about what they said. That version of the book did not have an introductory chapter. And the introductory chapter, which I wrote after that, basically provided the map for the book. Because exactly. guess what? This book is not your traditional book. And so, because the person picks up the book, starts reading, suddenly I'm jumping somewhere else. And so, that feedback from my friends made the book a lot better. Some other ones suggested I move the chapters around, this kind of thing. Actually, and I ended up writing the kind of breaking the fourth wall at the very end because of that. But I think... Even our innate response is kind of negative. We should observe that and kind of identify that and then give it to yourself a few minutes a day, whatever, and just come back and fix it. Again, I honestly don't think we're going to find something where our thoughts are not similar. <laughs> so being dispassionate is something that you absolutely have to learn. And being dispassionate and the ability to, I often do this. I often think of myself as a character in a movie that I'm watching. And then I think, what am I going to actually say when he does and says this? And more times than not, I'm going to be like, what a fucking idiot that guy is. (laughs) (laughs) This is very interesting. So 
I started to play chess over the last couple of years and because of my daughter. But there was something very interesting. So I started to watch a lot more chess videos. And what I observed is this. When you play the game, like actually I've seen this happen at tournaments a lot. Two people play the game. And then after this, this is a bit of chess. They go back. Somebody won, somebody lost or whatever. Or draw. They go back and study the game. Both of them. The two opponents. But then here is the very interesting trick. They don't say you or me. They say black or white. And what it does, it's basically, now it's not about you or them. It's about the game. And it's about white pieces and black pieces. Because chess is a lot more, like you can be completely in a scientist mode. Because it's math. So yeah, so that's kind of, you observe yourself kind of as a character. They just basically depersonalize it and say black or white. And if you do it enough, it just becomes an automatic thing that you do. And I find that what you really have to be is if you have a very difficult time, you're very doctrinaire in your beliefs, none of this is going to work for you because you will just feed, like you said, your subconscious is listening when you say I'm an idiot. And according to my thinker prover, Thing, the prover is going to start proving to you that you are in fact an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And so thoughts become things, things become words, words become reality. But when I was young, I did a, like a little mathematical formula, which was silly. But the basic nature of it was so there's energy of thought. This is outcome. This is, I'm trying to determine outcomes. And I started math formulas on everything. Like I tried. I still do it and I really shouldn't. I like create an algorithm for everything. Maybe because I'm just lazy and the <laughs> algorithms are so good. Anyway, so energy of thought times energy of action times energy of random occurrences squared. And if you think about that for a minute, two things come out immediately. Number one, you can be the most brilliant thinker in the world if all of that, that energy of thought number is 100 but the energy of action is zero, zero times 100 equals zero. So thus, that gave me the impetus to put everything out, put it on paper, say it, get people talking about it, because that's the way you bring it into the world. I love the abracadabra, I create as I speak. I'm going to steal that from you for sure. I will give you initial attribution, but then over time. I (laughs) should say it. But the other thing that's like really interesting about this is that when you push them out of your head, you A, understand whether you understand or not. Oftentimes you don't. You B, understand, is this something I actually believe? Oftentimes you don't. What happens then is that gives the hook to maybe my mom and dad or my friends or society gave me this idea. And so it's very, again, iterative, and it allows you to clarify your thoughts. And so I'm passionate about my belief that if you can't explain something in a simple, not simplistic, people often hear simplistic, simple, straightforward manner. And my hero in this is Feynman, the physicist, Richard P. Feynman. I mean, this guy could do this better than anyone. Him and Claude Shannon are gods, and they would go on my Mount Olympus. But it also bleeds over into what you're talking about. You said, hang on, emotional reaction, anger, because we're human beings. If people say something that we've done is shit, we might take that personally. And I get it. But if you're going to be long in our game, you have to have a very thick skin. And because hero, goat, hero, goat, hero, goat. (laughs) And I'm absolutely fine with that. But I want to turn this into a question. Is that a rule? Because this is new. I like this. Is that a rule that has changed other areas of your life or your behavior? Standing back saying, I would be angry, but I got to see why they said, yeah, tell me about something. Before I answer this, I just want to make one comment because there is a lot of geeks, investment geeks listening to you. And I want to make one elaboration, what you just said before. And then I'll, so when we do research here and we build financial models, a lot of times we start with what I call a tablecloth model. Everything you can have, we throw into this model in a spreadsheet. But we don't buy the stock unless we fold this model into what we call a napkin model. Something incredibly simple. Because at this point, it means we identified what really matters. Now, so let me answer your question there. That has a tremendous impact on me. 
because there is this framework, event, event, judgment, reaction. And what I try to do is to reframe, like event happens. And you're going to say reframe, right? Yep. I think the ability to reframe is a superpower. Continue, please. No, absolutely. And I try to reframe. If it's a negative, I try to reframe into positive because a lot of times what we think are negative are really not negative. They could be neutral or positive. And then, therefore, your reaction is going to be different. I remember you loved my Aikido analogy. Loved it. And that's because the beauty of that is that it consumes so little energy. Just reframing, all you have to do is look at things, look at it differently. And suddenly, there's a story I tell in the book, which is not that exciting story, but I, we were driving through the park with my kids and my aunt. And yeah, I remember my, that. We were driving my wife's minivan. And I want to stress, it was not my car, it was my wife's minivan. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend, David Roney, who I put on the podcast and I'm doing some stuff with now. He's this amazingly skilled, massive skill stack guy. And that's his current thing. The wife is saying, I think we need a minivan. And he's like, it's not going to be my minivan. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, but I was stressing it for a different reason because we were out of gas and I was driving her car. So we're in the middle of this beautiful park. I have my kids and suddenly we're out of gas, stuck in the middle of nowhere. And I don't know why I reacted this way. And because my wife is over out of gas. And I'm like, well, listen, if you are in the middle of this beautiful park, what if we just like, if we did not run out of gas, but if we just stopped here and spent 30 minutes, an hour, would we look at it as a problem? No. Also, I told her, I said, imagine we drove through the park and nothing happened. We would have absolutely nothing to talk about. This would be just another time we would drove through the park. Now we have a story. And you know, it's kind of interesting looking, there is another part to it. Like, I remember my son, Jonah, I think 18, 19 years old, he got a speeding ticket, his first speeding ticket. And we have a rule, if he gets a speeding ticket, he's paying for it himself. And I'm talking to him and he's visibly upset. But what I was shocked about, he was not upset about the money because he had to pay like $250, which was most of his money. Like that, I got pulled over, I got a ticket, and there is no story. Like, it was so boring. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it was so boring. And I'm thinking, my God, this is awesome. This is like exactly, like, you should be going through life and looking at life as if when something happens to you, a lot of times, this is just, you're talking about your character and story. I'm as a writer and you as well, we kind of program for that because we are looking for this. Like, my father... The paintings behind me and my father's. I read you all the time. And so I see your yeah, yeah. dad's and work so all the time. When we traveled and he always painted when we go on vacation, etc. He would always kind of put his fingers like this and look for things to paint. And that's a painter in him looking for beautiful things to paint. And so therefore, that's how he saw beauty a lot more than I did because he always looked for it. And I would argue as a writer, we programmed me to always look for stories. That's another upside of writing, by the way. Anyway. It's totally true. And people would often ask me, like, why are you still doing this? We sold our company. I'm retiring from OSAM. And I'm starting another company. They know that, by the way. Obviously, it had to all be pre-approved. But they're like, why? And I'm like, I live for the stories, man. (laughs) I mean, some of the experiences that I've had would technically be looked at negatively (laughs) by many people because they judge it on that particular outcome. But I loved that section of the book, too, because I was just, again, I'm just like, man, it's like we are quantumly entangled or something. Because, (laughs) And I have another good friend, Dave Chilton, and I'm going to briefly tell the story because it just fits so perfectly here. So his dad is like, I want to have his dad on the podcast because he is one of the most harmonious inflow person that exists. And Dave illustrates it with this story. Is it the wealthy barber story? Is it the wealthy barber? Yeah, he's the wealthy barber. Please do. I love this story. So Dave's been a good friend for almost 30 years. He's the one who got us to go up to Canada with the O'Shaughnessy method. Just a great guy. His dad, though, is like a Taoist sage. Dave tells this story. Dave's dad has Dave's son with him in Paris. This is pre-email, pre-texting. And he gets this excited voicemail from his dad. And it's like, Dave, it's dad. You're not going to believe what happened to us today. 
two of the most skilled pickpockets in the world, they got everything from us. They got our <laughs> wallets. They got our passports. They got all of our money. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? And David's like, that would like ruin my entire day. <laughs> and then he, he talks to his dad. He goes, well, why would I look at it like that? I have this great story. Your son thinks it's so cool. We get to go to the Canadian consulate because we need new passports. And we would never go on there. And we met some very nice people there. <laughs> and he just reframes everything. That is a gift. That is an incredible gift. It really, really is. I listened to that interview at that podcast. That was phenomenal. I really love Dave. So that was a phenomenal interview. Dave is a wonderful guy. I want to shift because this we could talk about this all day. And it's a bit more to coming to America, etc. Do you think that right now, if you had some friends in Russia, would you urge them to move here? Or has the world passed us by? This is something I wouldn't die on the hill. But it's something that I view very importantly. I think that we have botched our immigration policy to the point where I believe, and I want to see if you don't, if you disagree with me, I believe that despite all of our problems, we still are the place where the majority of the world's smart, competent, eager to create new things people want to live. And my point is, we should let them. Obviously, background checks, obviously all that stuff. But if we're giving an advanced degree in STEM, I think we should staple a green card onto the diploma. Do you still think that that's right? Or has the world made another place a better destination? I think the difference between the U.S. and other countries was so great in this that it may be shrunk a little bit, but it's still the place you want to go to if you want to take risks. Because... Taking risk is what really kind of, that's what makes ability to take risks and ability to fail, get up and keep going forward. Like I think in Silicon Valley, they call it pivot or something. I think there's a name for it. Say, yeah. <laughs> yes, pivot. <laughs> yeah. No, but absolutely. No, I think the America today, I would argue, I like the America 30 years ago when I moved here more, but it's still such a wonderful country. And it's still, there's a joke. As an economist, you understand this. When you look at the globe and you kind of say, like, where are you going to move? And then you ask, yeah, can I have another globe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, are, we are by far the best house in the neighborhood that may be getting worse. So in general. Maybe it needs a paint job and maybe it needs some fixing up. But I concur with you. I think that there are regime changes happen in investing, but they also happen in society. They also happen in the way that people reach a maximum point, then the pendulum has to swing back. That's the word I was going to use. Yeah, I think pendulum is the right word here. We go from one extreme to another. and then So I'm hoping the pendulum is going to start swinging the other way. So. I think it's going to be. I would much rather find things to root for than against. And I just think that we are now in a very unique place in history with the tools that are becoming available to smart, talented people are unprecedented. They're really unprecedented. And I just think that the world is going to be such an interesting, exciting place over the next 20 years. But we do need for the pendulum to swing back on some of the... The tribalism is bad. I just think it's bad. And Will Storr, again, I just did a big interview with him for Infinite Loops, and you guys will probably get released close to the same time. But this whole idea, he said, you want to see how deeply embedded in human OS tribalism is? Take 100 people, randomly assign them to group A or group B, and then watch what happens. All the group A people are going to say, group A is the best. And then they descend into what I call brain death orthodoxy. And all they do is like talking points at each other. And it is a meaningless exercise. So I think if we can moderate the tribalism a little bit by starting organizations that become idea labs, as opposed to propaganda labs, I think that there are enough people, I certainly, I know enough people like you, like Will Store, like my colleagues at Infinite Loops, who would love to be part of an idea lab. They would love to have serious discussions without disrespecting their conversant. So let me give you this example. And you observed it on Twitter. 
there's a Tesla and there's Tesla Q. And Tesla bulls and Tesla Q are Tesla bears. It's just talking about a company, a stock. And like if you observe two groups, there's complete animosity against each other. And there is token points. And I did this write-up on Tesla. I actually, I wrote the nine-part series of articles and we turned it into, into like a tiny book on Amazon where I did a Tesla analysis. And like both groups hate me. <laughs> <laughs> because my analysis was nuanced. F. Scott Fitzgerald has this quote, which I love and I'm going to butcher. About keeping two opposing ideas in exactly. their mind. Exactly. And still not go insane. Yeah. Great and quote. that was the very first line in my book. And I said, when you analyze this, you have to keep two opposing ideas because you can have Elon Musk who has changed the world for better as much as Steve Jobs did. But at the same time, he will do things that are incredibly questionable, unethical, and maybe illegal when it comes to some of his deals. And guess what? This is a complexity of human complexity. You can have a person who has a good side and a bad side. And the same thing, like my conclusion was, I love the car. The Tesla, I have absolutely love this car. And I had it for three years and I still enjoy it every single day. But at the same time, this was a few years ago, and I basically said, this is a path-dependent company, which means that if good things happen, if they get to escape velocity, I think they'll be very successful. If we have this severe recession, if they can't refinance that debt, they may have to issue a lot of shares. And I basically said, I have no idea how it's going to work out. That was my conclusion. Both sides hated me because I was neither bull nor bear. <laughs> but I think that's it. And I think in investing, this is extremely important, kind of be able to look at things from a nuanced perspective. One person I really like in the politics is Ian Bremmer. And the reason I really like him because he is able to look at the issue from different sides. And that is a very unique ability. Give you an example. He's the person who came out and he was anti-Trumper. However, he also pointed out the positive things in Trump's policy. And I think that takes intellectual honesty. That's a quality I, I admire. And he may be critical of Biden on some things, and that's when the nuance leaves. Totally agree. And I love, because you could set it up, that both sides hate you, because you are a heretic. You are an apostate to them. And if you understand this tribalism in terms of the layers it puts on a person's personality, then you bring in religion, then you bring in all of these things where people have literally defined themselves as this person, this guy or woman, and overcoming that and reprogramming yourself to be much more dispassionate. The results from that, vastly better. And the problem is that the world is not black and white. As you say, the world is nuanced. The world is not zero, 100, one, yes, no. What the world is, is mostly maybe. I love it. And what you have to be willing to understand is that, and yet still aggressively pursue opportunities that you think are going to be great, even though you still have it in the maybe category. And for us, I watch because it's just amusing. I'm incredibly amused by Elon Musk. Listen, I don't care what you think about him. He is entertaining as hell. And I once put a tweet up, which is, everything starts as a marketing campaign. The ability to reframe is a superpower. And we're all in the entertainment business, whether we know it or not. <laughs> because people love stories, right? Like, think about like when the General Motors CEO writes a tweet, it goes through 20 departments. There's 20 lawyers look through this, it's, you know, the whole thing. Elon Musk basically tweets from his bathroom. Right. And <laughs> that's why he has 50 million followers on Twitter. Exactly. Unvarnished. Distinctive. Are you kidding me? This is a very distinctive guy. And like, if you're looking for the attributes of who's the type of person who's going to succeed in this new environment, I think it's the antithesis of the old company man. And I think that you've got to be brave enough to A, fuck up things in public, learn from them, hopefully, move on. But you have to also be distinctive. You have to have a particular je ne sais quoi. And that's hard because so many people like fashion themselves out 
work with a lot of younger people, not just in finance, by the way, in a variety of industries. The first one that I have to try to get them to overcome is, no, fuck your brand. Let's work on you. Let's work on you presenting yourself as an interesting person. Because people, yeah, they love brands. Yes, I understand advertising. And yes, I drink Coke. If I do drink Coke or one of those sweet drinks, I will always pick a Coke because I've been programmed to, I get it. I understand. But it's sugar water. So if you can be yourself distinctively, I think that that's like really great. Which leads me to my question about another one of our shared loves, which is classical music. I've loved classical music since I was five years old, which is highly unusual. That only happened because my father loved not only classical, he loved big band, he loved swing, he loved jazz. And we didn't see eye to eye on much. (laughs) But one of the things, this gift that he gave me was he was a big believer that walking was the only good exercise. And so he got in the habit of walking a half an hour a day, four times a day. Well, I grew up in Minnesota, which would be the United States, Siberia. Like where I grew up in Murmansk. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) So cold as Siberia. But in the house I grew up in, we had a very long hallway. It was kind of a Frank Lloyd Wright style house. And so very long hallway. He was also into music and stereos. So and one section of the house was the family room. That was at one end of this very long hallway. And the other section was the formal dining room where my dad would spend most of his time. But when he was walking during the winter, he walked from living room to family room. And it was a reasonable walk. And so he would put music on. And I only know this because he told me this, but it fits. He said, one time I came in, you were about five years old, and you were sitting in the family room with your eyes closed. And you went, Jim, and you looked at me and you go, what are you doing? And he had Bach on, Johann Sebastian Bach. And he said, I looked at him and I said, Daddy, what is this beautiful, almost magical music? So I just dove in. I loved it. To me, it's like speaking another language almost. Because I saw a fun quote where it said that, The reason that music evolved really was that mathematicians wanted to hear what math sounded like. (laughs) (laughs) Let me ask a question. I hate when people ask me this question because I struggle with the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Who is your favorite composer? I mean, it is literally, this is a no win because I honestly don't have a favorite composer. So I turn into a quant. And I say, well, I'll tell myself who my favorite composer is. Spotify. By Spotify. Yep. And then the answer is Bach. Bach. I love the mathematics of Bach. That does not make me not appreciate the romantics. That does not make me not appreciate newer music. I love it all. And so, wait a minute. I thought you were a Mozart guy. And again, see what we're doing? We're trying to divide into groupings. You can't be both a Bach guy and a Mozart guy. Of course you can. And you can have tremendous admiration for fill in the blank. I know that you have a different answer. So you're going to tell me now, who's your favorite? So it's kind of interesting. I have many answers because, so when I write, a lot of times I listen to Bach. And the reason for that, because just somehow it works. When I'm stuck, really stuck, and maybe I just trick my subconscious to believe that, I listen to the opera because I feel like it works like the plunger for the writer's block. I think I gravitate towards Russian composers. Brilliant composers, yeah. To Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff because somehow... I I love both of those composers as an example. Maybe I just need this huge emotional content and that's what they offer me. But you're so right because here's why. Because at different points in my life, I listen to different music. I have this long essay where I like actually went back 30 years, which music I listened this year. And like I went from like, there was a year where I was driving to work and only listened to Brooks Violin Concerto. So Spotify at the time would have said that there was before Spotify. And then there was a time where I want to say late nineties, there was a movie that came out called Shine with Jeffrey. Loved Asgard. it. Loved it. Yeah. With Jeffrey Ru- Rush or Roth. Yeah. Jeffrey Rush. Yeah. That was the kind of the Jeffrey Rush coming out. Yeah. And I remember, I 
kid you not, for a year, all I listened to was Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. Like for a year, that's all I listened to. And I can't do this with all music because I listened to it so much. Now I can say this is a good performance or at least it's a performance I like. This performance I don't like. Like I can't do this with, I really have to listen to it hundreds and hundreds of times before I can do this. I do the same thing. My wife thinks I'm crazy and she's like, why are you just looping that piece over and over and over again? And I said, because there's just so much to it. And one of my favorite poets is T.S. Eliot. And he's got this beautiful section in a poem called Portrait of a Lady. And they're talking about going to hear a pianist, the latest pole, because Chopin was Polish. The latest pole transmit Chopin's preludes through his fingertips. And then he goes on to say, so intimate, this Chopin, like two friends just in a room. And there is so much, like your statement about the Russian composers, I love them. And you're right. If I'm in a mood to like get the emotions flowing, they do it. And what I love about that, and it's one of the reasons why I think I love music so much, is that I honestly believe it's the universal language. Because you don't need to be Russian to love Rachmaninoff. And so I don't know much about, I've read maybe one biography of him, but I don't know much about J.S. Bach, other than he had a lot of kids, and that he was still writing his music at a time when his profession was considered a servant. That's what I am. And the reason I like him is because he's just so clearly and obviously mathematical to the point where Hofstetter named his book Gödel Escher Bach. So Gödel, the mathematician, the incompleteness theorem, Escher, the wonderful graphic artist, where things are folding in upon themselves, and Bach. And if you haven't read that book, I would recommend it with an asterisk. It's like, I did it. It's really hard to read that book, but it's worth it. I think you'd love it because you would get what his message is and Hofstadter's a genius. But I'm so taken with music and the power that music has. By the way, it's not just classical music, contemporary forms of rock and roll, of rap, of all of those things. I love Naz, and he's got a song with Damian Marley, I think, called Patience. And this is a beautiful song, and the lyrics are just beautiful. And I just thought to myself, you know what's interesting? is these guys, like 150 years ago, they would have been poets. They would have been like, I contain multitudes. Pink Floyd would have been philosophy professors at Oxbridge. (laughs) And so the ability to reach people, because music goes like memes, by the way, memes work so well, because they bypass many of our filters. And they bypass the, I don't want to see this, the prover filter so does music and so do you find that your kids also have a love or are they like dad that's dad's thing it's complicated i have three of them so i have a story about this i'm the youngest child i have two older brothers and my parents took my brothers to a music school to study piano my older brothers absolutely hated it they hated so much that i think the story ended when my brothers literally broke the piano and put all the keys out of the piano. So my parents got the message. <laughs> they never really forced me into music. I think when I was 10, maybe 11, when my mom passed away, my father took me to music lessons. And I don't think I showed that much interest. And I think he probably did not have the energy to push me or he learned his lesson with my older brothers. So I never really got pushed into playing music. So... If you look at three of us today, my oldest brother, who was subjected the most to the classical piano music torture, piano lessons torture, he does not listen to classical music at all. Probably would not even listen. My middle brother, Alex, he enjoys classical music, but he doesn't have this burning desire that I do. He would go to concerts and he would enjoy it, but he doesn't have this burning desire that I do, even though his daughter is an accomplished violist in London, and she went to Royal College of Music. So when it came to my kids, I had to be very careful. So I pushed them a little bit to study piano to my two oldest kids. Neither of them showed an interest, and I did not push them too much. But one thing I did, we would listen to classical music in the car, we would listen to it at home. And this is very, very important, because 
I think the reason I liked classical music and the reason you like classical music, because you were introduced to it on the background. You were not forced into it. Classical music is complex. It has many, many layers. If you listen to, I'll give you a very simple example, Tchaikovsky Symphony No. 4. I was in Sydney, Australia, and I went to this performance of this symphony where the Vadim Ashkenazi was a conductor, who is a phenomenal conductor. I listened to the symphony for the first time, did not do anything for me. Like I walked out of the performance and it did nothing for me. I talked to my father about it and he said, this is weird because this is my favorite symphony. Jim, for the next three days or four days in Australia, all I listened to for six hours a day, that symphony. Now it is my favorite symphony, one of my favorite symphonies. Why? Because classical music is complex, not all of it, but it's not about Tchaikovsky symphonies. They're complex. And for you to see this complexity, you have to listen it many times to connect the dots. And here's what happens. I'm going to run this analogy by you. Tell me if it makes sense. You know, when you go on vacation, you're going to go to an island. You're going to go to the vacation and you really want to go there. And the anticipation of going to this vacation brings you as much pleasure as actually when you get there. And I think this is what happens to us when we listen to classical music on the micro level. Because you listen to this and you know the next part is about to come. And this gives you a tiny little dopamine because you kind of like, I like this part and this little, may take milliseconds, but it happens over and over again. And I think that's what happens to us when we listen to classical music. Now, I have a third child, Amia. She's eight. We took her to piano lessons and she said, I'm not going to go to piano lessons. Fine. And then like literally six months ago, We have a piano in our house, which is basically just a piece of furniture because I don't play piano. So it was just it's kind of relic for my kids. And Mia sit down and started to kind of tinker with that and started to compose her little thing, her little music. And then I said, well, why don't we take you to piano lessons? She's like, no, I don't want, want a piano lessons. And my wife says, well, you know, the music school, there is a yogurt shop right next to it. She's like, okay. And now, and so this gets more interesting. So she started taking music lessons and she likes it. This is the funny part. She had a new music teacher and the music teacher is trying to get to know her. And she's like, what kind of music do you like? Do you like some music from Disney and the songs? And Mia says, no, I like this. And she starts playing like just a few bars of music from Greeks per Gunt. Wow. And then she plays a few bars from Dvorak Symphony Number no. Nine. <laughs> like this is wow. like, this, yeah, like <laughs> I don't want to overstate that, but just enough so you can identify what it is. Here's the key. And this is, If people who are watching us listen to us as parents, I think the lesson here is that you want to listen to classical music in front of your kids, in your car, in the classical music concerts. And when you take them to the concerts, they probably will not want to go. But then what you do, you offer them bribes. In my case, I think part of the reason why I got into classical music, because my parents listened to it. They would take it to a symphony or to operas, and they would buy me desserts during intermissions. And that worked for me. But it's a very gentle, it has to be very gentle with every you because it has to be just because here's what happens after they listen to it enough, because it's complex, when they order, they may hear this music and it's going to click with them because it's been deposited in the subconscious already. They're not hearing it for the first time and suddenly they listen to it. My older kids today, they will not listen to classical music on their own, but they will go to classical music concerts, no problem. We'll listen to classical music in a car without objections. A lot of times I have to listen to their music as well, but then that's fine. So I was sort of a similar unfolding of that with my kids. I was chairman of the Chamber of Music Society of Lincoln Center. And so we're constituents. I was also on the board of Big Lincoln Center. And one of the fun things that I did that I found my kids were really responsive to was I just, I made sure there were always tickets there for them. And at the time, they were living in Manhattan. They've subsequently moved out here as my grandchildren were born. But that was it. It was like I would invite them to like the soirees where we did the concert, and it was fun. But I would just kind of, hey, we've got the tickets. You just let us know if you want to use them. And under that, they just felt a lot of freedom to be like, oh, my daughter-in-law married to Patrick is actually an accomplished pianist. And so she it was kind of her little push with Patrick, but it was a completely non-invasive way to let them enjoy learning about and or 
discovering classical. And so I think you're absolutely right. I love the tying in to it, the little treat, because that makes sense to me. I love that. I'm going to go for that for sure. I'm looking at our clock here, and I'm going to have to have you back on because I haven't even gotten to like the central thing that I wanted to talk with you about which is <laughs> your book, which is amazing. But I have a couple other questions. Obviously, we're both finance guys, and we're both finance guys who are really interested in a bunch of other stuff. And by the way, I find that profile again and again and again when I meet people in our industry. But soon after you got married, you said a friend gave you some really simple financial advice, which you yourself say was advice that changed my life. So I'd love it if you told our listeners what that was. So I was 28 years old. My friend Mark was 38, which if you think about it, like he was probably double my age, like because of the amount of wisdom he had. So he basically sat us down and said, listen, for you guys to have a happy life, you don't want to be strained by finances. And it doesn't matter how much money you make. If you don't spend this wisely, you always going to be running out of money. You're going to be in debt. And debt has its own costs and interest, etc. So you're going to be in a rat race. He said, you want to create a budget. Okay. And he's like, well, you list your rent, your income, your expenses. Jim, I got to tell you, at the time I was a CFA already. I'm like, listen, like I'm a CFA. <laughs> like I was a bit insulted at first. Okay. <laughs> he kept going. And he said, most people, when you say, you know what your income is, when you say expenses, people would say they're my cable bill, my rent, my utilities, this kind of thing. He said, those are the things that come to mind to you right away. However, there are a lot of other expenses that happen. It's just, they don't happen this month or on a regular basis. They just happen in different time frames, And an example, your vacations. You go to vacations with me once or twice a year. So they do, you know, but they do happen. It's an expense. Every so many years, you're going to buy a car. So that's the expense. And basically, there's a lot of expenses like that. You can add your retirement to that, kids' college education, all these different things. And he said, what's important to do is to create sinking accounts, to identify what these future costs are and bring them into present. And therefore, when you create a budget, you have the income, you have obvious expenses, and then you have those sinking funds. And what's left is this is the stuff you can actually spend when they stuff that is less important to you. There was something else he said. And what budget does, it helps you to prioritize your expenses, your values. Let me explain what I mean. So a lot of times we do things mindlessly. We go to Starbucks on the way to work because at some point in time, we went to Starbucks on the way to work. And we buy coffee because that's what we've done. And we end up spending sometimes thousands of dollars. Now, if you receive a tremendous amount of joy from this, that goes on a higher level. If this means absolutely nothing to you, just go on a lower level. And maybe you find that your vacations are more important than that. So therefore, because no matter who you are, unless you are Bill Gates or whatever, no matter how much money you make, you could still run out of money if you don't spend money wisely. So by basically prioritizing your expenses, the money buys the most when it buys things you value. And I think that's really the key here. And so by you creating the budget, you mindfully, and this is the key, going through your budget and say, this matters to me. And therefore, this kind of this waterfall, if I run out of money, like after I paid for my vacation, my kids' education, whatever, that I don't have money for Starbucks, well, it wasn't that important to me anyway. And I think this was very, very important to me. And then there was another layer to this. So money doesn't buy happiness. Or does it? Well, maybe a little bit. So money, there is a, a symmetric relationship here. Below a certain level, lack of money can cause a lot of unhappiness. But after a certain level, the incremental dollar you make brings you a lot less happiness. Okay, big agree on this. However, what you find is that when you spend money on experiences, it buys you more happiness because I was listening to podcasts and the guy was telling a story how Arthur Brooks, he was telling a story how when he got married, him and his wife were broke. On the first wedding anniversary, they had this fight. What are they going to do? Because he wanted to buy a couch and she wanted to go on the beach. And he said, they came to an agreement. They went to the beach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could have called that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And he said, the interesting part, he said, this was like 30 years ago. And I don't know how many couches we had since. I don't remember the couch we bought after that. But that vacation, the trip to the beach, that actually, I can still remember this. So what we do, we make a mistake at times that we think the tangible things are tangible. Actually, experiences, our memory is actually a lot more tangible. So there are certain things. I'll tell you my, like the things where at this point in my life, there are four things when I spend money on, I have a very loose budget. Experiences, time, meaning I buy time. Like I got to be so careful because I'm going to sound like this wealthy hedge fund manager. I'm not even a hedge fund manager, but <laughs> I'm going to be the typical stereotype. Okay. But we have a finite amount of time in a day. I'm going to do it in a way now that I'm not going to sound like a hedge fund manager. Okay. I absolutely hate mowing the lawn. I hate doing this. So guess what? I buy the time. I buy this money time that somebody else comes in and mows my lawn. Okay. So also I run an investment firm. So to schedule this, Interview probably took about 10 emails between your assistant and my assistant. You could have spent this time doing something creative, high value time, or you and I could have been exchanging emails. So that's why you and I have assistants who do scheduling. So you and I are buying time. To me, that's important. Another thing is health. When it comes to health, I only can live once. And then at this point in my life, I can't afford this. When I go to the store and I buy tomatoes, I don't look at the price of tomatoes. Okay. And the last thing, education. This is very important. I tell my kids that they can buy as many books as they want, as long as they read them. That's why my daughter reads as much as she does, as long as she keeps reading the books that she buys. But this is an important point I want to stress. I have very little, like I have a lot of more, I'm loose in those categories because they are the most valuable to me. But I still live in the same house we lived, we bought 18 years ago. Until recently, I had a car for 12 years. So my point is, there are things that, I'm giving up something as well because I may be making, I'm making a decent living, but it's not a limited amount of, amount of money. Well, again, this is now I'm starting to get a little freaked out because we did everything the same. I too said to my children that they could buy any amount of books they wanted. I would always buy them books. And I didn't even make the condition that they had to read them. And we made our average Saturday when my children were younger was always to go to the bookstore and the biggest one that we had. And literally, we would spend almost the entire day there because the kids would end up, I'm really not exaggerating. Both of my daughters, my middle daughter is an accomplished author and she has her second book coming out. My youngest daughter is a stand-up comedian, but it turns out she has a talent for writing as well. Patrick's written a book. Kate has, she's got two, one out, one coming out, two more contracted for. So I just, that also feeds in to experience over a thing. The experience of all going to the bookstore every Saturday just got them habituated to reading And the other thing I did, if you were at my house here, you would say I have a very, very big library. And like when my kids tried to use me pre-Google as Google, I would point at the bookshelf and say, look it up in there. Because that also just feeds that curiosity. This is nothing you and I have in common because I make a big deal about going to bookstores with my kids. And then it gets to the experiencing self and remembering self. And Danny Kahneman, I spoke to him I was lucky to be sit in on one of his private things put on by my friend, Annie Duke. And he's very passionate about the difference between the experiencing self and the remembering self. Because the remembering self, that's where the experience is. And I too, just like you, I'm very loose on experience budgets, especially if they can involve my entire family. And so it's not even close. The trips... We're going to get to this, and then I'm going to invite you back because this is going to have to have a part two because I want to talk about your book too. But so, the, <laughs> well, we actually have been, but the experience just so outweighs anything. The first time we were in Africa, we had the entire family. And if you haven't been to Africa, oh my God, you've got to go to Africa because it's almost a spiritual experience. And I'm not like a spiritual guy. And I was the guy who didn't want to go. 
And I'm like, oh, Africa. Uh. And of course, I just ended up loving it and the African people. But what the memories are all the memories of our family experiencing all this together. And then Cambodia and our guide was exactly my age. And he was one of only two surviving members of his class of 50 because of Paul Pot and the killing fields. And he gave firsthand accounts that made you weep about what he lived through. And like my kids too, it's like whenever we're all together and we're talking about happiest memory, most interesting thing, it's all experiences, not necessarily as a family. There were some in there that were just me and my wife or my son and his wife or my daughters and their husbands. But this idea of understanding the experiences so far outweigh getting a new thing. So we're incredibly simpatico there. So let's make our last topic the idea we also share <laughs> a love and not just for doing it, but for what one can learn of travel. Talk to me about why that animates you so much. I especially love traveling to Europe. Same with me. I've been to South Africa, which is, I'm not sure it's, it's as real Africa as the... Yeah, it's not. Kenya, yeah, yeah. Botswana. It's like Santa Barbara. It's like going to Santa Barbara. Really. A little, little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think traveling, my best memories, some of my best memories are traveling with my family when I was little. But also, so my mom passed away when I was 10. That was a, like incredibly, as you can imagine, traumatic experience. But like there was this silver lining, which is I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I started to value and appreciate my father so much more because I realized, like I was afraid that I'm going to lose him. And this became kind of part of my subconscious. So I always made an effort to spend time with my father. So my father, and so therefore, as an adult already, as when I was married, my father and I would travel together, just to South Africa. I gave a speech in South Africa. My father and I went there you know, together. I gave a speech in Europe. Like we went there a few times. We drove to Santa Fe many, many times. In fact, I'm going there tomorrow with my daughter. We go to Santa Fe and I live in Denver. So that's a eight hour trip. It became our family tradition. In fact, when we come to Santa Fe now, and we've been doing it for, I think, 10 years. And my daughter, Hannah, who is coming with me, and my son is in Switzerland right now. He's coming on Saturday. So we just two of us are going. I remember last time we were in Santa Fe, my kids were, we would be walking by something at, my son and my daughter say, point something like, Dad, remember this. We had dinner there with my father or something funny happened. So traveling became a very important part of my life because those are kind of, it's almost you experience life. If you think about our lives right now, you probably have the same monotonous life. And to some degree, you come to the office, there's a lot of repetition. Traveling interrupts that. We just came back from uh, 10 days in Europe with my kids. And I tell you this, we visited four countries, I don't know, 11 cities probably, 10 or 11 cities. And I tell you, these 10 days felt like I'm thinking about them as a year because every day we did something different. And therefore, I didn't even think about it, but that's the way you're kind of slowing down life a little bit because you added new textures to your life that were not there before. This is why I never thought about, I'm going to try to verbalize my love traveling, but I think this is kind of, it became a big part of my life. And one thing actually I realized, this is a deeper topic, and this is kind of part of American culture, I think, a lot more American culture than European culture, is that we think our life will begin when we retire. I would argue Europeans do a better job doing this. Yes, I agree. In Vienna, you go to a coffee shop and you see somebody sitting there for two hours drinking this little tiny espresso and read a newspaper and I feel like they learn how to slow down life. And the same thing comes with travel because what happens to us is that, well, we're going to travel when we retire. We kind of get this attitude. And I find that, well, when I retire, I may still be traveling, but it, that doesn't mean that the from 20 to 60 or whatever, I'm going to retire. I'm never going to retire anyway, so it doesn't matter. You never will never retire. It's not like you and I are lifting heavy boxes and stuff. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I found about this is that I have to make an intentional effort to travel because the daily life gets in the way. And therefore, I have to stop and schedule traveling. It's like, because if I go on autopilot, I know I'm a workaholic like you probably, I'll just keep working. I'll keep plowing. 
and therefore by kind of forcing myself to travel again I, it's a just stopping my it's, i don't want to say forcing meaning like oh my god i'm going to travel i don't want to do this not quite the opposite but i have to get off that autopilot and schedule traveling very good answer i had the same experience i just also think that the ability to experience different points of view and different sensitivity to initial conditions and path states. For example, if you're trying to help somebody understand path states and the contingencies that they force upon us, it sometimes is helpful to make examples of people who pre-internet, like if they were born in, I don't know, Bangladesh. I invest in Dan McMurtry's anchorless Bangladesh VC fund. Prior to that, They just didn't have, unless they emigrated to the U.S. or somewhere in Europe, they just didn't have the opportunity that they now have. But it's very helpful to understand that there are different constraints on different mental models. There are different reality tunnels. And the more that you travel, the more you experience them firsthand. Like, for example, if you get a chance, if you've never been, to go to Bhutan, I highly, highly recommend it. I totally agree with your point about we Americans being workaholics. And you want a people that have nailed lifestyle, the Italians, man. It's hard to (laughs) kick them, take the crown off their head because we go to Italy, well, absent that we didn't go during the pandemic. But prior to that, we went to Italy at least once a year, often twice a year. But not just Italy. So we wanted to go broadly and learn things. So I have one more answer, actually, I just realized. This sure. is this, it allows you to expand your myopic circles. And this is what you're talking about. So let me run this by you. I don't have a single friend who smokes. Not a single, like, you probably don't have either. Nope. Now, so it's very easy for us to assume that nobody smokes. But interesting part, once you identify somebody who smokes, I'm sure... The people, those people know, most of them smoke. Of course. And that applies to everything. You can make the same argument about vaccinations. So we kind of live in this kind of little tiny bubble because we surround ourselves. We want to socialize with people who are like us. Okay. And by, and this, I'm, I'm really just explaining on the point you made, but by going outside of our myopic circle, and that creates myopia because we see the world through only our environment. By traveling, it allows you to see the world, you expand your circles and see the world from other people's eyes. And you just, you said that, but I'm just kind of giving it from a- I love that. And I often refer to it as opening your aperture. If you're a photographer, you know, the aperture lets in. Yeah. So the more open your aperture can be and the less judgmental you are, I often find that people think they're thinking, but they're just judging. And- <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan of thinking. Well, so when I put this up on Twitter, as I always do, saying we did it, I'm going to just say part one. <laughs> because uh, we still have, I don't think we touched on any kind of investment things, and you're a bit of an expert there. So I think that we could let's help do it. our I'm happy. listeners. I would be delighted to do part two. So you get two bites at this apple because you're going to come on again. But the question, as you probably know, because you listen, that I always ask everyone at the end is, we're going to make you the emperor of the world. You can't incarcerate anyone. You can't send anyone to a re-education camp. You can't kill anyone. But what you can do is you have a magic microphone and you can speak two things into it that will incept the entire population of the world. They're going to wake up the next day thinking that these two things are their ideas. They're not going to know that you implanted these ideas in them. And they're going to actually pursue these two things in the way they behave, in the way they act, in the way they treat people. What two things are you going to accept as the magical emperor of the world? So the first one is easy. Be kind. And this is just because this is something I realized the world needs more kindness. Let me put it this way. The first one is easy. The second one, so like I would go back to, like if I go back to my 18-year-old self, a 19-year-old self, I'll tell myself, read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends, and learn that you don't have to win every argument. That's a very specific message to myself. But I feel like I'm this, 
I'm trying to get people to listen to classical music. I don't know. It's almost became this huge passion of mine. In fact, I have this website called myfavoriteclassical.com where I just put up my articles in classical music. Yeah, I know, I've I just, been there. Yeah, I have this article on the front page, which is basically a playlist I created, what I, which I called the gateway drug to classical music. <laughs> I carefully created this list that if you never heard of classical music before, you can listen to it and I promise you, you're going to love it because it's not going to have Tchaikovsky Symphony number four because that should be in the second list after you already became a fan. Okay, that's too difficult. I guess I would want people to listen to classical music. I love them. I love both of them. And you also get the treat of when we do the second half of this, we'll talk more about like investments and other things like we're interested in. But what's fun is about this is, as I was saying to my wife beforehand, I said, like, I really don't have to prepare. I just know we're going to have a fantastic <laughs> conversation and it's going to go where it's going to go. It's phenomenal. I'm delighted that it went to our shared passions. Well, this has been fantastic. Jim, thanks so much. We will make sure that all of those links, I'm going to help you push your gateway drug. So that'll yes, be up on absolutely. me. So this has been great. Jim, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy Vitaly's 2021 Almanac, a collection of his best articles from 2021, packed together with some art for a pleasant read. To download a free copy, visit contrarianedge.com almanac. To listen to more episodes, visit investor.fm. Enjoy life and prosper. <laughs>